Uh, next up, we have Caleb Meyer from Parsons. He's going to talk to us about Raya. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, title of my talk today is RIA, Optimizations to Support Real-Time Graph Queries on Accumulo. This presentation was developed by me, Pooja and Aaron at Parsons, and Dr. Adina Kranachinu at the Naval Academy. The work I'll be discussing today is a collective effort of the RIA Parsons team, which is sponsored by ONR, and the RIA founders, Dr. Dr. Adina Kranachenu, Roshan Panous, and David Rapp. So I'll start by giving a little overview of RIA, um, just some general background. Since we're talking about queries and query executions, I guess you've gotten a sense that it's some sort of a data store. I'll talk a little bit about query execution RIA to provide some context for uh, the main topic of this talk, which is query optimizations. And then um, we'll wrap up with some, uh, some results. So RIA uh, is an RDF triple store that's built on top of Accumulo. RDF, the resource description framework, is a W3C semantic standard for representing linked and graph data. So in its essence, RDF is essentially a collection of statements which are serialized as triples. A triple consists of a subject, a predicate, and an object. So we have a couple examples of triples here. So Caleb works at Parsons, and Caleb lives in Virginia. And as you can see, a uh, collection of triples implicitly defines a uh, directed labeled graph structure where the nodes are the subjects and objects and the edges are the, the predicates relating them. We query RIA uh, using the language Sparkle. Sparkle has this recursive, uh, recursive acronym which means short for Sparkle Protocol in RDF language. It's, uh, it's a lot like SQL. We have a uh, familiar select statement, where statement. Uh, in the select statement, you have your variables of interest. So anything with a question mark is a variable. Within the where clause, you have what are known as triple patterns. So triple patterns are a lot like triples, except you're allowed to have variables within the triple patterns. Within our where clause of the, um, in the query at the bottom of the page, we have um, two triple patterns. People works at Parsons and people lives in Virginia. So the first triple pattern will give you all the people who work at Parsons and the second triple pattern will give you all the people who live in Virginia. One of the primary differences between Sparkle and SQL is that joins are done implicitly within Sparkle. So given two adjacent triple patterns within the where clause, you're automatically going to perform a join over those. So you, you'll perform joins over common variables. And if two adjacent tri triple patterns don't have a common variable, you'll end up forming a direct product. So for this query here, we'll get all people who work at Parsons and live in Virginia. Uh, RIA is currently implemented as the sale API in um, OpenRDF, which is a well-known open source um, Java framework for processing RDF data. SAIL is, of course, an acronym, which uh, stands for Storage and Inference Layer. So as you can see, the primary role of the SAIL API is to process the query, uh, develop a query plan, and then execute the query. You can see that here. So the key idea behind making RIA an efficient data store is the composite uh, key index. So the index is comprised of three tables, the SPO table, the POS table, and the OSP table. Uh, in the SPO table, triples are written in the row ID and subject predicate object order. In the POS table, triples are written in the predicate object subject order. And in the OSP table, triples are written in the object subject and predicate order. Uh, this indexing system exploits the lexicographic uh, ordering of row IDs within Accumulo. And uh, if you think of a collection of RDF data as being comprised of data from a number of different graphs, we could actually sort, uh, we, we could conduct queries over triples contained within certain graphs if you actually store the graph name within, say, the column family. And you can do that efficiently using something like locality groups. So again, uh, this indexing system uh, makes uh, RIA an efficient triple store in that if you're given a triple pattern with at least one constant, we can very efficiently map that triple pattern to uh, a range scan using one of the tables. So let's talk a little bit about query execution in RIA now to set up our discussion about query optimization. 
So I've already mentioned that the primary role of the sale, sale API is to uh, parse the query, develop an ex, uh, a query plan, and then execute that plan. So all the optimizations we're going to be talking about here in a second are during the, the query planning phase. Without any optimizations, the query that comes in uh, effectively determines the query plan. So for example, we have the query select X where X works at Parsons and X lives in Virginia. So the query plan is going to be generated by this query uh, is, is going to be determined by the order of the triple patterns from top to bottom. So we'll first evaluate the triple pattern X works at Parsons. So we can see here um, that triple pattern gets mapped to a range scan of the POS table. POS table because works at is in the predicate position. It's the first constant that appears in the triple pattern. So we scan that table and we find that Bob, Greta, and John work at Parsons. And we take each result from that table and then we perform um, a range scan, in, in this case a lookup, uh, in the SPO table and we find that Greta and John uh, work at Parsons and live in Virginia. That's the result of the query. So to further illustrate this idea, we'll add another triple pattern to our example query here. We'll add the triple pattern X commutes method bike. So again, we start off uh, by scanning uh, the POS table to evaluate X works at Parsons. Remember, we're going from top to the bottom within the uh, query because there are no optimizations built in here. Take, uh, so, so we get our friends Bob, Greta, and John, pass those into the SPO table from a lookup, find Greta and John, then finally evaluate the last triple pattern uh, by passing and Greta and John into an SPO, uh, the SPO table using doing a lookup. And we find that Greta satisfies the query. Uh, she works at Parsons, lives in Virginia, and commutes uh, via bike. And graphically, we can sort of see this process in the upper right-hand corner. When a query is issued to RIA, it gets parsed and is represented as a left-leaning uh, tree, effectively. So the first node that gets evaluated is the leftmost node on the bottom. That Those results then get passed to the right node, and those results then get passed up uh, the tree, uh, as indicated by the graph here. Sorry. Okay, so what are the challenges of query execution? I mean, if you could just issue a Sparkle query and get your results, you know, and those were determined by the order of the query, you know, we wouldn't be here, right? It wouldn't be interesting. So, so what are the challenges? Well, you know, we want to be able to query massive amounts of graph data, right? And we're all impatient, so we want our results quickly. So the problem with querying massive amounts of graph data is that you potentially have to form, uh, perform a large number of lookups and a large number of comparisons. Um, so to illustrate some of the challenges associated with um, developing effective query plans, consider the three queries in the middle of the page. So without any optimizations, um, these queries are all going to determine their own query plans. And they're all essentially the same. They all return the same, num same, same results. They all have the same triple patterns. We just permuted the orders, OK? So the query on, so, so let's, let's also assume that we have some, some knowledge of the number of results that will be returned by the triple patterns with each, within each of these queries. So we know that, say, 8.3 million people live in Virginia. There are about 15,000 Parsons employees. There are 750,000 people who commute via bike. Okay? So let's use that as a baseline. So the query on the left, if we go to evaluate that, we're first going to find our 8.3 million Virginia residents, right? And then for each of those residents, we're going to have to perform a lookup to evaluate that first join, right? Uh, it's not so great. Let's look at the second and the third query. So we'll first find our 15,000 Parsons employees, and for each of those to evaluate that first join, we're only going to have to now perform 15,000 lookups. So already, right, we're having to perform far fewer uh, comparisons and lookups. So the second and third query are already heads and tails better than the first, uh, first query. Okay, but suppose we have some additional information. Suppose we know that 100 people wor who work at Parsons commute via bike, while 1,000 people work at Parsons um, uh, live in Virginia. Okay, so with that additional knowledge, we can see that when you evaluate that first join in the third query, right, we're only going to get 100 people ba back and we're going to have to perform 100 lookups. Whereas in the middle query, we'll get 1,000 people back and we'll have to perform 1,000 lookups, right? So in some sense, we could see that the third query with this additional information is the uh, query plan of choice. So what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is that the order in which the triple patterns are evaluated in the query, the query plan, drastically affects query performance. And we need to develop tools to uh, be able to somehow effectively order these, these triple patterns. So that's more or less going to be the focus of the discussion from here on.
So let's talk about some of these optimizations, some of these tools that we develop to effectively order our uh, triple patterns to form our triple plan, our uh, query plans. So when it comes to poor query, query performance, we found that joins are usually the culprit. So we have three general approaches here to uh, developing uh, effective query plans, um, developing uh, responsive queries. So, and they all have to do with ways, of, uh, uh, they all address joins. So the first, uh, the first approach is to just reduce the number of joins. So the general idea behind here, behind this is, you have some, number, some queries that are issued uh, to your database, and you somehow score those as being important, right? And you store those results away, and you tag them with some metadata, so you can come back and get them later. And then a user issues a query, and you want to somehow match uh, those, those results, or those subqueries that are already conducted, uh, to some, some portion of the query that's issued, right? Thereby reducing the number of joins in the query. Uh, that, that's issued. That's the general idea there. Uh, the second approach is to limit the data and joins. And this is essentially the approach that we discussed when we were talking about uh, the challenges of query plans. We want to order our triple patterns in a way that um, is most effective. And the tools we, we've developed to do this are um, re re rely on cardinality. So cardinality is just a fancy word for the number of results returned by a triple pattern. And join selectivity, which estimates the number of um, items returned by joining two triple patterns together. And the final approach here is to make joins more efficient. So that would entail uh, distribute, distributing the join processing using uh, Spark or MapReduce, using maybe more efficient joins like hash joins or intersecting iterators. So this works very much in its infancy and will be a subject of future research. Um, the, main, uh, the main approach I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is limiting data and joins. And then I'll touch briefly on ways that we can reduce the number of joins uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so what are some ways we can limit uh, the amount of data that's passed across joins? So uh, the most basic approach is using cardinalities. Look at, we document the number of results returned by triple patterns. We, we have that, that information at our disposal during the query planning phase, and we order the triple patterns in the, uh, in the query plan accordingly. So here we, we have our example query that we've been uh, talking about, and we just order the triple patterns from lowest cardinality to highest cardinality so that each time we go to perform a join, we have to, uh, we have to basically uh, perform the fewest lookups, right? So it's a pretty simple um, idea. And we implement this in RIA uh, using MapReduce. So the idea is we keep track of single com what I call single component cardinalities and composite component cardinalities. So for single component cardinalities, um, you would track the number of times a given constant appears in a given component in a triple, uh, in all triples in, in your triple store. So for example, you would count the number of times worksat appears in the predicate position within all triples in the triple store. For composite cardinalities, you keep track of the number of times pairs of constants appear in pairs of positions within triples in your triple store. That was a mouthful. So you would keep track of the number of times worksat parsons appears in the predicate object positions within triples in your triple store. Okay? And so again, these are all computed using MapReduce. We want to we want to compute these all in advance so that uh, we don't have to um, look, uh, uh, compute these aggregations during the query planning phase, right? We want query planning to go as fast as possible. And so we store the cardinality type and the constant information, the row ID and the value in the um, value field uh, within our Cumulo key. So for example, if we were storing the composite cardinality of works at Parsons, we would, st we would write predicate object in the row ID works at Parsons and then store the um, cardinality in the value field. And so you can configure this in, in, in a way so that if you, you set a threshold so that you, your, your uh, cardinality table can be sparse, so you only store cardinalities above a certain value. And the key uh, idea here is that what really matters is the distribution of the cardinalities, the relative sizes of the cardinalities. So you would only need to run this MapReduce job if, say, you ingest a certain amount of data, that portion, the proportion of that data exceeds the, uh, uh, exceeds, the amount of that data exceeds a uh, certain proportion of the amount of data that was originally in your table, or you get data from maybe a, a different source, um, something like that. 
So uh, if, if the cardinality method solved all our problems, that would be the end of the talk and we could all go home. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't. So there are, it, it has its limitations. So we'll add yet uh, a few more triple patterns to our example uh, query here to, to illustrate those limitations. So let's add the triple pattern vehicle, vehicle type SUV and X owns vehicle to our example query here. And we'll assign some cardinalities to them and then we'll order them according to cardinalities from uh, lowest to highest. Okay. Now let's walk through this. Um, let's walk through this query uh, during the evaluation process. So we first evaluate X works at Parsons, then X commutes method like. We have the number of results that we get from computing that join. And then we go and, and we attempt to join on the triple pattern vehicle, vehicle type, SUV. What's, what's going to be the problem when we try to join this triple pattern on? Does anybody know? What's that? No, we'll get way too many records back. So the problem is, is we have no common variables. The vehicle, right, is it, that variable is not common to uh, to X, right? So the problem is, when we perform that join, our query is going to blow up, right? We're going to get a direct product. So going back like two or three slides ago, I said, you know, there are 100 people in uh, who work at Parsons who commute via bike. So using that as a baseline, we have that, the, those 100 people, right? And we pass them into this join. So we pass them in this join. We're going to with 100 times. 2.1 million people, which is the number of people, the number of SUVs, right? So we're going to end up with 210 million results at this point in our query, right? So our query is totally going to blow up, and this is going to be a very inefficient query plan. So the idea is we also need to keep track of the amount of results returned by joins uh, in, between triple patterns in our uh, when we're doing query planning, and this this idea is uh, um, is encompassed by what we call join selectivity. So the idea behind join selectivity can roughly be seen when we compare the two queries that I have pictured here at the top of the slide. So the top left is just a query from the previous page that's ordered uh, according to cardinalities from lowest to highest. And the, uh, the query on the top right has been um, ordered according to cardinalities and join selectivities. So if you, go through the, uh, if you go through the query in the top right, we can see that it's no longer strictly ordered according to cardinalities. Um, but we can see that there are no more pesky direct products looking around there, right? So it's somewhat, so we, we've sort of ordered it in such a way that we're trying to maintain the cardinality order, but then if we're, we're confronted with something like a direct product, well, we, we rearrange our tri triple patterns according to some criteria. I'll get into that more in a second. So the approach we use for joint selectivity is taken from a paper written by um, Thomas Neumann and Gerard Wickham that's implemented in RDF3X. And the idea is we want to compute our joint selectivity in advance. Just like our cardinalities, we want some statistics that we can uh, use in advance and uh, use when we're doing our query planning. So we don't have to compute these things on the fly to make query planning as fast as possible. Um, but we're going to need to estimate joint selectivity. Um, the idea is that computing the joint selectivity, the number of results returned for every possible pair of triple patterns that pertains to every triple within your data store, gets to be fairly computationally demanding. So um, we, we resort to using uh, an, estimate, uh, an estimate that's uh, taken from this paper um, uh, by Neumann and uh, Wickham. So, What's the idea? So I'm a mathematician by trade, so I sort of felt obligated to put in uh, a slide that had some equations on it. So the idea is we have two triple patterns, XP1, O1, and XP2, O2. Here, X is a variable, P1, O1, and P2, O2. They're uh, just generic constants. I didn't actually assign them values because, of, because space is limited. And the idea is we want to compute the selectivity of joining these two triple patterns together. So here, the join is represented by the little sideways uh, hourglass, so you guys have to all remember your uh, ex, uh, what is it, your exterior algebra or whatever it is from your database class or whatever. Um, so the idea is that we, we compute the selectivity of joining those two triple patterns together by taking the minimum of the selectivity of the first triple pattern joined with the full table and the, the selectivity of the second triple pattern joined with the full table. Okay, so let's think a second about what we're actually doing here. So you, we observe that we're sort of, we've removed the predicate information from uh, one of the triple patterns 
And, and both of those values that we're taking the minimum of. So what we're actually getting here is, is sort of a worst case scenario for the amount of results returned by um, joining, joining these two triple patterns together. We're actually going to get a bit of an overestimate, right? So this approach isn't as maybe precise as it can be. There may be other, other approaches out there, but it does a good job. So how do, we, how do we compute the selectivity of a triple pattern joined with a full table? I guess here I should say full table uh, is indicated by the triple pattern with all variables, right? There are no constants within the triple pattern. Uh, so x, y, z with all question marks in front of it indicates the full table. So how do we compute the selectivity of a triple pattern with the full table? Well, we compute it using, uh, in this case, using the sum at the bottom of the page. So what's the intuition behind that sum? Well. In the numerator, we have, we're summing over all triples, C, P, 1, O, 1, right? So, so those triples are the triples which satisfy our triple pattern, right? So our triple pattern is X, P, 1, O, 1. So all triples that satisfy that are going to be of the form C, P, 1, O, 1, where C is just some constant. And for each of those triples, we're summing the single component cardinality of C. So basically, we're summing up a bunch of cardinalities that associate with, 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 with each triple. So the, the, the end result of this is the number of triples uh, that we're going to get from that join. Okay? So that's what it's doing. And then what's going on with the denominator? And the denominator, we're essentially normalizing. So the result will be between 0 and 1. So that uh, quantity in the denominator is essentially the number of results you would get if you formed a direct product of, of the uh, a number of results you would get from your triple pattern uh, with the full table. So I guess here I should uh, mention that these vertical bars around the triple pattern, that's, uh, that's just shorthand for cardinality. So, um, so, so that's what it's doing. So you get a number between 0 and 1. And for a little bit of intuition, if you get a selectivity of 1, that's essentially telling you, oh, you're forming a direct product. This is, this is bad, right? And if you get a selectivity of 0, it's essentially saying, oh, well, actually Actually, when you try to join your triple pattern with the full table along that particular component, you're not going to get any results back, right? So, and then, you know, you have everything in between. And so, so the idea is, the benefit of this is we're, we're, we're getting something that tells us whether we have a direct product or not. And if we have a collection of triple patterns, all with common variables, we're actually going to prioritize those joins, um, which return the fewest results. So let's go back a few slides back. Uh, here. So remember we have this, the second and we have the third um, execution plans here and or, or our query plans here. And remember we, we decided that the third query plan was the most effective, right? And we used this extra information which said that 100 people work at Parsons, that only 100 people who work at Parsons actually commute via bike, while 1,000 people uh, who work at Parsons actually live in Virginia. So the idea that we're using here is joint selectivity, right? We know that only 100 people are going to return by that first join, whereas 1,000 people are going to, uh, that only 100 people are going to be returned by the first join in the, in the uh, execution plan on the right, while 1,000 are going to be returned by the first join in the execution plan in the middle. So that's, that's kind of a simple example. So how is joint selectivity implemented in RIA? The idea is we use a, a greedy algorithm approach. We can't really try every combination of uh, orders of triple patterns to, to form our query plan because, um, you know, that's, that computationally gets kind of ugly depending on the size of the query, right? That's something on the order of factorials, right? So that's bad. But the idea is we, we build our query from the ground up. We pick two, our two triple patterns which minimize a, a certain cost function. Cost function is pictured here in the middle of the slide. And the idea is that this cost function somehow measures the number of scans and the number of comparisons that you're going to have to make to perform that join. So we pick the first two uh, triple patterns, which minimize that cost function. And then we add in uh, triple patterns uh, uh, accordingly, which, which minimize that cost function. Um, and the idea, again, here is we, we avoid um, direct products and we prioritize joins which return the, uh, the fewest number of results. So how do we, how do we implement, the, how do we pre-compute these statistics within RIA? So the idea is we essentially need to compute the sum two slides back. 
So we need to, we need to for, for, for a given triple pattern, we need to compute its selectivity with the full table. So we have to compute this sum um, in advance using MapReduce. And so this slide just documents the process of computing that sum. So the idea is for, for, for each triple pattern, we need to uh, look at each triple that satisfies that triple pattern, sum its associated cardinality, right? And so this can be divvied up into four MapReduce jobs, roughly. The first job processes the the SPO table, so where we have our triple stored. The second job processes our cardinality table. So, so remember the cardinality table we discussed uh, earlier in the talk. So we assume cardinalities exist in this case. So we, we have to process that table. The third job merges the, uh, the two. So we're associating our triples with the, with the associated single component cardinalities. And the final job sums them up. And as far as that normalization factor is concerned, uh, that's just a quick lookup during, uh, during query planning phase. And the key idea here is that um, we, want, we want these results in in advance so that during query planning we can compute the, uh, the query plan very quickly. So that, that concludes my discussion about methods to limit the amount of uh, data passed across joins. So what I'll briefly talk about ways that we can limit the number of joins within a query plan in RIA. So the idea here, as I've already alluded to, is we, we've, we've pre-computed some query, right? We have the results stored in some accumulo table somewhere. And suppose this query gets issued, right? And we've pre-computed the portion that's uh, highlighted in blue. And the idea is we want to say, hey, I recognize this sub subquery within within the query you've issued. We already have those results. Let's plug those results in and let's speed this whole process up and reduce the number of joins we actually have to compute. That's the idea. So this is illustrated a bit more explicitly in this slide. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have our query. And in the lower right-hand corner, we have our pre-computed result. And so when the query, uh, the, the stored result, um, when that query is issued to get that result, we may have some different set of variables, right? But the idea is we have the result. We have some uh, Sparkle uh, string, some metadata attached to that result, which allows us, when, when, the, when the query in the upper left-hand corner is issued, to go through our collection of pre-computed queries, find the query that matches uh, as a subquery the, 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 uh, the query that was, that, that was issued that we're trying to evaluate, right? So, um, so basically, we, we pre-compute the query, and we have the stored metadata to match. And then there's this normalization process here where we can see, OK, if you look at the, the lower right-hand pre-computed query, we can see that the matches the, uh, the light blue portion of the query that's issued after we relabel the variables, right? So there's sort of some variable normalization, like sub, sub-query matching up to, up to relabeling a variable variables that goes on there. And that's the idea. And when we can find a match, we can you know, cut the query time of, 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 a given quish, of a given query. You know, We can reduce it to about a fifth of its original time. So it's a matter of isolating queries that are important, storing those. Um, and that, that's, that's very much an area of future research. OK, so to finish up, I just want to talk a little bit about some results that we obtained um, using our cardinality and joint selectivity optimizations. So here we have a table that uh, contains query times uh, for 14 queries, or I guess in this case 10 queries that we ran against the Lehigh University benchmark data set, which consists of about 33 million triples. We used base RIA with no optimizations, uh, RIA with the cardinality, optimi cardinality optimizer, and RIA with the joint selectivity optimizer. And here query times are in seconds. Um, we omitted queries uh, 2, 5, and 9, and 13 uh, because of complexity. They were taking way too long. We only ran those three times, whereas the queries that I've shown you here uh, were all run 12 times. Uh, and those are our cluster specs. So as you can see, as you go across the board for any of the queries that I've pictured here, you can see that uh, the performance of the optimizers is either comparable or uh, generally gives us drastic improvements um, in the query time. So I'll just give you a second to take it in. All right, maybe that's long enough. All right, so what's, what's, what's our summary? So the summary here is that uh, more or less these optimizations work, right? If you looked closely at the data from the previous slide, right, you saw, OK, maybe uh, some of the optimizers added a little bit of time on. But that's essentially because the complexity of the query was somewhat low. And there's an overhead in the optimization, in the, in the query planning process, right? So that, that sort of stood out. But, more, but generally speaking, these optimizers uh, for a query planner work. And uh, 
uh, in particular, when you're dealing with ad hoc queries, you're just feeding a Sparkle query and you're not manually optimizing the, uh, the triple patterns within, within the query, right? Uh, join selectivity uh, works, works well. As far as pre-computed joins are concerned, um, like I mentioned, you find a, uh, a pre-computed join that matches some sub-query, some portion of, of a query that's issued, you can cut your query time uh, so that it's, it's about 20% of what it was. So drastic speed ups, uh, but maintaining the index indexes, um, determining which indexes uh, we want to stay save, uh, it's, it's a difficult problem in an area of active uh, research for us. And that's it. Um, we didn't really investigate uh, the, the impact of using different ontologies. Uh, we, we, we used a base ontology, I believe, when we were querying the Lovum data set. And we, we did use inferencing. I don't know uh, exactly what ontology that was, but we only used uh, one ontology. So we didn't actually compare query performance with optimizers against different ontologies. So that's, that's something to look at going forward, maybe. Yeah. Um, no, so we actually we didn't we didn't keep track of like intermediate results that uh, that that we got back as as the query was being processed. I think I think maybe those statistics are some some optimization uh, optimizers. Do you keep track of that? We we didn't, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly how how that would have. I imagine that would affect query performance. Certainly, the more more data that you have to touch and, and getting your results longer would take. But we didn't keep track of it. No, that, that's a good question. I mean, so we're talking about maybe a triple store that, you know, maybe has 40 or 50 million triples in it or something, and the threshold might be like 50 or 10 or something, right? So, so very low, but enough to weed out things that really, you know, don't matter too much. But certainly you don't want to set it high enough that you're, you're actually, like, affecting your, your, your distribution. Um, so, no, good, good question. Um, so currently you do, um, you know, you could probably do it, you know, using Cumulo, uh, some sort of a Cumulo feature as far as the kernalities are concerned. Uh, joint selectivity, you do have to implement a map reduce job, but, um, so right now there's, there is no streaming feature, uh, simply because for joint selectivity, you're having to sum up all these cardinalities, um, that are in your cardinality table. Um, I'm not, I don't know. Some, some extra thought needs to be put into that. Um, I'm a little unsure as to whether or not that can be done, but I'll say I don't know. Uh, we do make use of the visibility. Uh, that's absolutely one of the reasons that we, uh, um, Rhea does use um, Accumulo. Uh, what version of Sparkle do we use? What? <laughs> uh, we're in the process of making it open source, but uh, if you talk to Pooja and um, I, th we ha there are some restrictions, but they're pretty minimal, so just talk to them and I could probably get it for you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll be up here for a few minutes afterwards if you, anyone wants to talk to me personally. Okay, thanks. Okay.